infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, filarial worms are long, thread-like worms that live in the tissue and body cavities of vertebrates. Uh, their eggs mature into tiny larvae called microfilaria. There are at least eight filarids that are of importance to humans, and today we're going to be talking about two of them, Wisteria bancroftii and Brugia malayi. And joining me to discuss filariasis is parasitologist and author, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary. Welcome back to the show. Hi there. Thanks for having me again. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's go ahead and start with Wisteria, um, the most widely distributed of the filarial parasites. Uh, Rosemary, where is this parasite found? And what are, what are the estimates on how many people that are infected? It's found in a rather broad equatorial belt. So if you go around the world, around the equator, uh, Africa, Central Africa, the Nile Delta, also Turkey, India, Southeast Asia, the East Indies, islands in the Pacific, Australia, New Guinea. So, you know, as I said, all, all around the world in the, in the equatorial region. Also some Caribbean islands. I don't think I mentioned that. And it is, as you said, the most common. The disease that it's caught, that it causes is called lymphatic filariasis. And they think about 120 million people altogether and fully 90% of those people are infected with Rucheria bancrofti. So about 108 to 110 million people. Now, the other parasite we're going to be talking about today is Brugia malayi. And this is more confined to Asia. That's right. If you knock Africa and the Americas off the list that I just gave you, you basically have the geographical range of Brugia. And, uh, There's a third as well, Brugia timeri, yes. but that's much less common than the other two. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the estimates on how common Brugia is? So about 12 million people, 10 to 12 million people are infected with Brugia. Okay. Now, can you describe the life cycle, and are there any significant differences in life cycle between these two parasites? The life cycles are very, very similar between the two. There are some differences in the mosquito vectors, but, but other than that, basically it's the same life cycle. The adults live in the lymph vessels. So these are the vessels in our bodies which carry tissue fluid back to the circulatory system after it leaves the veins and goes into the tissues. So that's where they live. They, the females produce microfilariae, as I think you mentioned. You can hear them called various things, larvae. They do look like a larva, but really they're more of a larva-shaped ova, or perhaps they might be best described as an embryo. They do have internal organs, and they do have a sheath, which differentiates them from some of the non-pathogens. And these circulate in the peripheral blood. Interestingly, they tend to be present in the peripheral blood from around 10 p.m. in the evening to 2 a.m. in the early morning. Otherwise, they're found much deeper in the organs, often in the pulmonary vessels and the deep tissues of the body. So the time when they are present in the peripheral blood happens to coincide with the time that their mosquito vector tends to bite. And that's how they get from one person to another. The mosquito ingests the microfilaria when it bites, and then there is a period of development within the mosquito. It can actually make the mosquito ill, but nobody, feel too mu nobody feels too much sympathy. <laughs> and uh, they migrate eventually to the, to the um, they get delivered to the next human host, migrate to the lymph vessels, and mature again to the adult worms. And you mentioned already that the adults are found in the lymphatic system. Uh, Rosemary, That's can you right. talk about the morphology of these adults? 
Yes, they are long, very, very slender worms. They're sometimes described as looking like angel hair pasta, so that will give you an idea of just how fine they are. The female can be up to 10 centimeters long and about 300 micrometers wide. The male is smaller, as is very common in the nematodes. He's about perhaps a third the size of the female. And can you just... The microfilariae are... Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. The microfilariae are microscopic, so they're maybe a couple of hundred uh, micrometers in length. So we see these in blood films in the lab, and right. you wouldn't be able to detect them otherwise. Uh, if you were reading a blood film, you might come across one. And when you're looking at the microfilaria, how do you differentiate the two parasites that we're talking about today? Well, Geography can help you a lot, especially if you um, are looking at something from an area where one of them is more common than the other. The morphology of the microfilariae can be helpful. Uh, it's all about the arrangement of the nuclei inside the microfilaria, whether they go all the way to the end of the tail or whether there's a gap. Mm -hmm. And this all sounds so easy when we talk about it, <laughs> but in practice, when you see these things on a blood film, they really love to lie on their tail. Yeah. And it can be very difficult to see the arrangement of those nuclei. But that still remains the, the predominant way that they are detected and identified in the lab. Of course, there are serological methods. We can detect antibodies against them. But um, these methods are not widely used. Yeah. And in the textbook, uh, it looks a lot easier than it does in actual practice. Oh, textbook photos are always perfect. Yeah. But the, the microfilariae <laughs> don't read the textbook and they don't know they're supposed to, <laughs> that they're supposed to lie just so. <laughs> Ain't that a fact? Um, now, the disease, you kind of alluded to this also, is basically the same for each parasite. Um, can you describe the symptoms and the pathology of these parasites? Yes, as we said, you get the parasites from a mosquito bite, but initially there will be no symptoms at all. It takes about a year for the worms to mature. Once you do start suffering symptoms, it's usually uh, something like inflammation, maybe some fever and chills, swollen, tender skin, and uh, maybe abscesses around dead adults, secondary bacterial infection, that kind of thing. And then for some people, but definitely not all, you get the famous elephantiasis where we see the pictures of people in textbooks whose scrotum is so swollen that they have to carry it in a wheelbarrow. Right. And women, sometimes their breasts can be affected, so they get very enlarged breasts, limbs, arms, and very often legs just uh, suffer extreme enlargement. The simple explanation for this has always been that the worms cause a blockage of the lymph fluid, but there's definitely a lot more to it than that. There's a lot of inflammation going on, and many of the symptoms may be or almost certainly are a result of the body's immune response to the worms as much as the physical presence of the worms themselves. And no discussion of these creatures is complete without mentioning Wolbachia. Wolbachia is, is a bacteria, it's an endosymbiont mm -hmm. that lives inside the worms and they apparently can't live without it. So one thought has been that perhaps one way of, of defeating them is to use an antibiotic that will kill the Wolbachia, never mind the worms. But it's also thought that many of the immune responses of the body are in response to the Wolbachia and not so much a response to the worms or even the microfilariae, which is very interesting, oh, I sure think. sure is. I would love to see the studies on that. Um, and, and Rosemary, we all, the, when you have the elephantiasis, there's also an increased risk of bacterial, secondary bacterial infections also, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Often the skin becomes very roughened and cracked and thick and subject to, you know, invasion by other things that can set up infections. Sure, yeah. Sure. Now, when, when you're treating the early stages when the microfilaria is just present in the blood, how is that treated? Well, the drug of choice has been for years and still is diethylcarbamazine. 
Uh, it is kind of known for its side effects, but it is generally safe and, and quite effective. So it's been around for a long time. Uh, as you mentioned, it's going to be most effective in the early stages because once you get things like elephantiasis developing, it's very, very difficult to reverse those. And sometimes it's not reversible, although they've gotten a bit better about, you know, corrective surgery and the use of pressure garments to try and reduce the size. Mm -hmm. um, and what about methods of prevention and control of this parasite? You, you mentioned that uh, Wisharia has, you know, 100 million people can be affected at any one time. So what can be done? Yes. Uh, well, the best way to avoid it, of course, is to prevent mosquito bites. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done. But to, as we mentioned, those mosquitoes, they tend to bite at a certain time of day. So even if you can protect people from those night flying mosquitoes, uh, that can go a long way towards lowering the, uh, the number of people who get it. And um, there have been some efforts with the diethyl carbamazine to treat large, you know, large numbers of people to prevent it from being transmitted. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and close out today's show with what we normally do. Any interesting stories about filariasis? Yes. Well, if you didn't know it was a small world, you'll be surprised by this story. It uh, features none other than the father of astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. His father was apparently a parasitologist, and one of his chief areas of study was lymphatic filariasis. He was involved in the development of that drug, diethyl carbamazine, mm -hmm. way back. And uh, he realized that it was not really very effective against the adults, but effective against the microfilariae. So one might have thought that it wasn't a very good choice because even though it might kill off the microfilariae in the blood, you still had the adults. But it did offer a means of interrupting the transmission because if you can kill off the microfilariae, they're not in the peripheral blood when the mosquito bites. Right. So he proposed adding this drug to salt. And the idea was picked up by none other than Chairman Mao of China, who ruled from 1949 to 1976. And he was, as you probably know, quite an iron-fisted guy. Mm -hmm. And if he told you to do something, you did it. So he instituted mass treatment of uh, the people of China by adding diethyl carbamazine to their salt. And he treated huge numbers of people and was actually successful at virtually eradicating it from China. And I believe today there is no or very little Wicheria Bancrofti transmitted in China because of that because of that endeavor. Well, that's quite a story. Yeah. A nice little yes. history lesson there. And, uh, uh, of course, we always appreciate um, that side of your expertise, Rosemary. And I want to thank you once again, Rosemary Drizdell, for your time and your expertise, ma'am. Thank you very much. Always my pleasure. Thanks so much. If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com.